Father in heaven, please bless us as we continue to learn how to not only be good preachers, Father, but to ground our preaching ministry in our connection with Christ. Father, we want to be effective communicators of the gospel in both public and personal settings. But Father, most importantly, we want to be connected to him who is the gospel, Christ. And so please teach us that and then also give us a passion, a burning in our bones, a burning in our hearts to share Christ with others, with those around us, both large and small congregations and audiences and groups. Help us to have a passion for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we've talked about the messenger's commitment, which is the most important. And then now let's talk about the meaning's correctness, which we've actually talked a little bit about already. But we'll get into a little more detail here to try and sort of get our fingers wrapped around what do we mean from a biblical perspective when we talk about preaching. We need to define our terms properly so that we can say, uh, we know that we're all speaking the same language. When I say preaching, you don't just see a tie and a suit and a pulpit and Sabbath morning, okay? Yes, that is a kind of preaching, and yes, that is a manifestation of preaching, but it is not an exhaustive definition of preaching. So the question, what exactly is preaching? And this is an important question because an incorrect definition of preaching will send us down the wrong path of how to do it effectively and powerfully. So notice our next slide here. Truth communicated through personality, the proclamation of what is true through you, okay? So truth communicated through personality. This is our working definition of preaching. Now, there's very good uh, reason for us to desire to be preachers in the biblical sense because all of our models in the New Testament were preachers. For example, Jesus was a preacher. The Bible says in Mark chapter 1 and verse 14 that Jesus came how, according to that verse? How did he come? What does the verse say there? Preaching. Yeah, Jesus came preaching. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, it says, And Jesus went, how did he go? He went preaching. And then in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, when he's reading there from the scroll of Isaiah, the Spirit has anointed me to preach. And so Jesus' ministry was a preaching ministry. Okay? And as far as I know, he never wore a tie and probably didn't wear anything like what we would call a suit. So we can immediately disassociate in our mind this idea that preaching is somehow associated with suit and tie, suit and tie, okay? That's what I want to really get into our minds here, is that preaching is not the clothes you wear or the place that you stand or what you stand behind. Preaching is something fundamentally uh, different from all of those things. Uh, the disciples were also preachers. Luke chapter 9, verse 2, Jesus, when he sent the disciples out, the Bible says, and he sent them to preach. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, the apostle Paul says, for Christ sent me to preach. Acts chapter 5, verse 42 Speaking of the early church, it says they ceased not to preach. And we'll be talking more about that in our church history class in a couple weeks. Acts chapter 8, verse 4, they went everywhere preaching. Acts chapter 9, verse 20, and straightway, this is the Apostle Paul after his conversion, straightway, in other words, immediately he preached. And Acts chapter 10, verse 42, this is Peter uh, basically saying uh, when he was being uh, questioned by the religious leaders, um, he says, hey, he commanded us to preach. And so we find that all of our exemplars, all of our models in the New Testament, Jesus and the early church, they were all preachers. They were all what, everyone? They were all preachers. You are also called to be a preacher. But let me be clear, that does not mean that you are necessarily called to be a pastor or an evangelist or a minister. The only reason you would think that is if you had the inappropriate distinction in your mind, which we have borrowed from Catholicism, between laity and clergy. Right? We have this distinction between the laity and the clergy. I am clergy, you are laity. But this is an unbiblical, well, it's not totally unbiblical, but the way that we relate to it is unbiblical. God has called, in fact, we just quoted Acts chapter 8 there. Take a look at Acts chapter 8. You've probably seen this before. Somebody might have already brought this to your attention. But let's take a look at it anyway, just to refresh our minds. And perhaps you've not yet been shown this. Go to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, we'll pick it up in verse 1. Acts chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Now Saul, everybody get there, I'll give you time to get there. Acts is in the New Testament. <laughs> Acts chapter 8, and verse 1, it says, Now Saul was consenting to his death. Who wants to tell me? There we go, very nice. Uh, and at that time a great persecution arose against the who? The church was, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Okay, so according to verse 1, have you been over this already? Okay, according to verse 1, 
Who was scattered and why? The church. The church because of persecution. According to verse 1, who was not scattered? Who remained in Jerusalem? The apostles. Okay, very good. Verse 2, and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. Verse 3, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Now look at verse 4. Therefore, those who were scattered. Now I want to ask you a question. Who is it that was scattered? Apostles. The church except who? Apostles. So were the apostles scattered? So we might say the clergy were not scattered. Okay? The pastors were not scattered. The church was scattered. The laity was scattered. The rank and file was scattered. Verse 4. Therefore, they who were, those who were scattered went everywhere doing what? Okay, so according to Acts chapter 8, verses 1 and 4, who was it that went everywhere preaching the word? The church, the, church, the laity. We often think of the disciples as going out. And yes, later they did. Thomas goes to India, etc. Later they did go out. But in the early burgeoning days of the apostolic church, the early church, it was the laity who were preaching like wild men. It was the laity that were going out. In fact, take a look at verse 5. I love this. And Philip went down to the city of Samaria. Here's a case in point. Of course, here we have the conversion of the eunuch coming up. But it says, and Philip went down to the city of Samaria, and I love this, and preached who? Christ. Christ to them. So what I've done in my Bible, I'd recommend you do the same, is uh, I would go to verse 4, where it says, preaching the word, and I would underline that, preaching the word, and then I would go to verse 5, and I would underline, preached Christ, and I would draw a line between them. And the reason is this. Whenever we are preaching the word, according to this, these two verses, what should we be preaching? Christ. 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 Yeah, what were they preaching? They were preaching the good news about Christ. So the Bible says that they went everywhere preaching, but they were preaching Christ. Can you say amen to that? And that's what the Apostle Paul says there, right? 1 Corinthians chapter, what is it? 2 verse 2 or 2 verse 1 there. He says, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And of course, he talked about a great many other things, but it was always in the context of Christ and him crucified. And so, here we have a great example of the fact that it was predominantly, I don't want to say predominantly because it was also the, the disciples as well, but it was equally the laity who were preaching. Amen? It was equally the laity that were preaching. And we need to disabuse our minds of this distinction that laity and clergy, laity and clergy, God has called all of us, in keeping with the priesthood of believers, to be preachers of the gospel. Can you say amen to that? That includes you, Amanda. 19 or 18? 18 years old, young, and a preacher. Alyssa, what are you, 19? 18, man. Look at you little girls. God has called you to be preachers, right? God has called you to be preachers. Who's our youngest boy? Is that you, Mitchell? Stephen, you're, what are you? 17, a babe in the woods, wet behind the ear. God has called you to be a preacher. God has called all of you to be preachers. Ozzy, God has called you to be a preacher. Armando, God has called you to be a preacher. All, God has called all of us to be preachers in our own capacity. Are we together, everyone? Yes or no? Okay, that's biblical. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Okay? Now, in talking about the word preaching, we, we encounter two primary words in the New Testament that are translated as preach. And the first is keruso. This is the Greek word. To herald, proclaim, or publish. To herald, proclaim, or publish. And euagalizo to announce good news, to declare, or to bring. Okay? So notice that these terms are actually pretty general terms, really. To proclaim, to publish, to herald. That means basically to speak. To speak. And here, to announce good news, to declare, or to bring. To speak. So we often take a very narrow definition of preaching. Very narrow, here again, in front of a church, Sabbath morning, with the suit, with the tie, standing behind the pulpit. And yes, that is a definition of preaching. Okay, in the same way that all apples or apples can be red, but not everything is red as an apple. This can be preaching, but this is not all that preaching is. Okay? We need to broaden our understanding of preaching, and then we will start to see ourselves as preachers. See, when I say that you're all preachers, many of you think, oh, he's got it wrong. I'm not a preacher because you think you're not Doug Batchelor. You think you're not Mark Finley. You think you're not Dwight Nelson. But that's not all that preaching is. What you've been going out and doing in the community, knocking on doors, giving Bible studies, that's preaching in a biblical sense. Does that make sense? That's preaching. When you witness to somebody and give your personal testimony, you're preaching. If it's just a one person, that's preaching. And it's very interesting to me that preaching has unfortunately taken on a very negative term today, hasn't it? Like, hey, don't preach at me. I'm not here to preach. Okay? 
But, but the reality is this. We don't have to use the language. There's nothing sanctified or special about the word preach. But that sharing from a biblical context, that sharing, that communicating, that proclamation, that publishing, that's preaching. That's preaching. Okay? Nothing about the word is particularly significant to us. It's just what it communicates. Here's what Ellen White says. Our confession, our confession of his faithfulness is heaven's chosen agency for revealing who to the world? Christ to the world. We, to re we are to acknowledge his grace as made known through the holy men of old, but that, she, in other words, she's saying basically we should preach the Bible. We are to acknowledge his grace as made known through the holy men of old. That's an obvious reference there to uh, 1 Peter, 2 Peter. But that which will be most effectual is the testimony of what? Our own experience. We are witnesses for God as we reveal in ourselves the working of a power that is divine. Every individual, now this is awesome, every individual has a life distinct from all others. True enough? Of course. We see evidence of that all around us. And an experience differing essentially from theirs. God desires that our praise shall, shall ascend to him marked with our own, what is that word? In, uh, this is one of my favorite quotations from the pen of Ellen White. I love this, that God desires that our praise shall ascend to him marked with our own individuality. What that means then is that if you're standing in a congregation of people and sufficient numbers of people are singing so that the singing is taking place, but you are not singing, no one notices that you're not singing particularly, but God does. You see, because when I sing Onward Christian Soldiers, it is fundamentally different than when Kia sings Onward Christian Soldiers because she's a fundamentally different person than I am. Her worship is different than mine because she's a different person. We can sing the same song, and yet I bring a host of experiences, my past, my, uh, the, the person that I am, I bring that to bear on my singing or on my preaching or on my praise. And so therefore, no one else's praise can ever take the praise the place. Let me just turn this off here because it's driving me crazy. I don't normally have reception up here, so I, for some reason, keep getting these texts. Okay. No one else's preaching can take the place of your preaching. No one else's prayer can take the place of your prayer. No one else's praise can take the place of your praise. Does that make sense? Because you bring something unique to the equation, and God wants your praise, your preaching, your songs, who you are, to ascend to him marked with your own individuality. That gets us right back to our definition of preaching. Preaching is what is true, what was it? Through, through you. True through personality, what is true through you. These precious acknowledgments to the praise of the glory of His grace, when supported by a Christ-like life, that's what we were talking about earlier, first being a Christian, then being a preacher, have an irresistible power that works for the salvation of souls. What kind of power do they have? Irresistible power. So the proclamation of the truth, when coupled with a Christ-like life, irresistible power. The Spirit of God is going to move on the hearts of people when those two things come together, when they converge. Okay? Trying to preach like someone else, as we've said, effectively robs God of the unique contribution that you alone can make to the kingdom of God and its furtherance. This is, this is why it is essential that you, and here you go, write these four down. These are critical. This will inform not only your preaching that you will do here in a few weeks, but it will radically inform the way that you view preaching for the rest of your life. Okay? You need to strive to be true to four things. And the first, of course, is to be true to God. Can you say amen to that? Yes. And that's what we were just talking about there, having a living, dynamic, genuine, authentic connection with God for yourself. Okay, so the first is to be true to God. Be honest with God. Be true to God. Don't be doing these, you know, inappropriate, dodgy things, you know, over here.